For multiple inventories, what we can do is use the same multinomial distribution, but on several inventories that we could try to overlap. But it looks at the probabilities of exclusive data from one inventory. I think I, yeah, I wrote quickly here formula yesterday. <coughs> I go over again. But it assumes that inventories are actually independent. If inventories are not independent, it is biased. It's violating the basic principle. But anyhow, <coughs> probably Anchao's estimate of the expected, expected number of species. Uh, is that right? Because I, I did it on, on my own memory. <coughs> it's probably the simplest one. It relies on that a distribution following some kind of log linear uh, plot as, can I get rid of this? Yeah. Are you familiar with the Whittaker plot? We take here the number of, sp of uh, individuals and, and we put here the number of species order uh, from most numerous to less to least numerous and we use this in log terms and a Whittaker plot is basically something like this, which means that the relationship between species and frequencies or abundances is basically log linear, right? <coughs> well, then we then can take advantage of that and derive the insight that what is important is basically the tail. And especially within the tail, those appearing only once or twice. <coughs> so we have few abundant species, species and many non-abundant or rare species. So the probability, as, as we saw in the morning, the probability of getting a new species with additional inventories when we increase sampling has to decrease unless we have something like we have to learn the bird song or whatever. But normally it will be increasingly difficult to get new species in the inventory. What about using more than one inventory from the same place? Independent inventories taken at different places, at uh, different times, for instance. We might have, as I saw yesterday, inventory A, inventory 2, a total of 11 species, and we might look at the species that are exclusive from one inventor, inventory or the other. This and this and this and this and this. And uh, Sever and Felton had a problem. They were marking animals, and they knew that the marks, the tabs, the, the tags, uh, kept, kept getting lost. So they figured out that if they put two different tags on the same animal, they could figure how many animals had lost the tag because those animals would come up with one single tag. If they put one ring in the left leg and one ring in the right leg and they find a bird with only one ring, we know that the other ring has been lost. This is very basic. And as we saw yesterday, the number of rings or the number of, of, of animals with tags includes those that have, no, have lost no tag, those that have lost one, those that have lost the other, and those that have lost both, and we don't know, we can't recognize them. And we can derive a formula which comes straight from probability theory, so it's quite easy, that gives us how many animals have lost both tags. And since it, since it comes straight from probability theory, we can use exactly the same theory to derive how many species are missing here because they have lost both inventories. We can say that species 11 has missed inventory A and species 7 has missed inventory B. But they were both in the place, all right? As, proved, as proven by having appeared in a different inventory. So it's exactly the same mathematics. There is nothing new here. So we can use that formula to, der to derive from two inventories how many species should have been caught. However, this formula has a large variance, and the confidence interval tends to be large if the inventories are small. The larger the inventory and the higher the overlap, the narrower the confidence interval. Another way to increase the confidence interval is trying to use more than two inventories. 
So I generalized this model <coughs> some time ago into this thing that is basically the same thing. It's applying a multinomial distribution to any number of columns. Uh, <coughs> this was published and this is the general distribution which uh, don't forget about this formula, it doesn't, it's just the, con the concept. The operational formula is this one. Basically, it's the product of the probabilities of missing inventories. Hmm? So you have to take all the possible outcomes. If you have three inventories, there are eight possibilities. Missing one, missing two, missing three, missing several combinations of two, missing all three. <coughs> and in the end, you can calculate K as a simple product of all the probabilities of missing inventories, more or less. It's a little bit more than that, but basically it's it. And I was running some simulations the other day, trying to see how the in confidence, confidence interval narrows by using a random set of data, and then sampling it. It's basically a bootstrapping it. It's, it's, it's a bootstrap technique, it's nothing new either. And you can see that the more inventories are there, the narrower the confidence interval. You can even get numbers with very, very small confidence, confidence intervals given the right conditions. So what is the workflow with taxon gaps? We need to estimate the completeness of data. We need to resolve names to high, higher taxonomies. That's the first thing to do, homogenize taxonomies. We, want, we, we might want to do a tree map or a leaf <coughs> a plot. It's a different kind of plot and compare the observed taxa distribution with expected taxa distribution. And we have to be careful with rare species. And we might compute basic diversity metrics. We might try to plot this Whittaker plot and see whether this is high slope, low slope. A high slope means that it will be very difficult that new species will there. A low slope means that a lot of new species will appear. It's very, uh, a, a, a low slope is similar to what um, Tom showed us before in, a, in the effort species curve, like being this, I mean not really fluttering out, <coughs> and if possible calculate a CESP. Now time gaps. Time is an illusion, free time doubly so. Time gaps. <coughs> Remember what we saw yesterday, time flows in one direction only. Data that had not been caught will never be caught from the past, will never be recovered from the past, ever. Let's distinguish gaps from natural trends. That's very important because by nature, time data is not linear, it's not homogeneous, so we might see features which are basically natural trends. And some other features might not be natural at all. Remember the whales yesterday? I show you this plot yesterday, which is the number of sightings of Juvarta or humpback whale over time. So we see this plot here. We see obvious gaps. There are no data in these years, submarines. But it's also very scant data over the first two thirds of the century. And then a couple of spikes, three spikes in fact, this one, this one, and this one. So what might, be, what might we be looking at here? There are two possibilities. Either the population of humpback hum, hum whales was like, was like this, or our data collection was like this, from a constant population. Which one is your guess? Data collection? Humpback whales were actively hunted until here. So it might be that the population was really low too. But it might have been data collection system a problem because we know that the data collections have been, had increased over time. Let me show this other plot here. I am not telling you what it is. Data collection or natural cycles. <coughs> What's your guess here? <coughs> this is actual cycles. This is a uh, data on a pest. This is the, um, the Brassica, uh, uh, Collins brassicae, it's, it's a butterfly that has outcrops or 
in certain years, become suppressed. And it has been sampled continuously with exactly the same methods for, one cent for, for almost one century in Germany. So we can be sure that these data here are actual numbers. <coughs> or what about this? This is also a natural population. This is mink or something like that from Canada. It has natural cycles. So we cannot equate this to a gap. We cannot equate this to a gap. This is natural. So it makes life difficult for us. Because how can we know that there is a gap when there is an obvious numbers gap here and not a natural cycle? That's the trick. And that's something that there is no solution for this, other than systematic sampling, perhaps. So which question should we ask when, you, when we analyze time for gaps? First and foremost, are there natural trends in this population? Are there natural trends in this set of species? Because if there are natural trends, we have to factor them out in order to find the, the gaps. We need to look for baselines, previous knowledge, the expected natural curves. Are there natural cycles? Is the species seasonal? Does it, does it migrate? So we have to look for unsampled periods of time. We have to look at the distribution of our sampling periods and see whether there is some specific period which is missing. Is there a sampling effect? We might relativize data by sampling a fort that might help us to convert a line over time that has bumps into a line that in which those bumps are independent of the sampling effort. But quite often, time gaps are combined with other gaps. So we might have a combination of time gaps, and space gaps, and taxon gaps. And this is extremely common. So we need to, ex to cross-examine time gaps with other sources of information or other dimensions of the problem, such as <coughs> geography <coughs> or taxon. This plot here comes straight from GBIF and is the number of data records that have made into the GBIF dataset from 2008, or into GBIF index to be precise, from 2008 into nowadays. <coughs> and as you see, it has increased over time. So we wanted to look a gap for a species which is included in this index. One of the very first things we, we need to do is to factor out the increase in data availability for that species, which will guarantee us nothing because that particular species might have started to appear here or because this particular increase has, is due to the accrual of that species, for instance, birds. This is goes for animals <coughs> and this goes for plants. <coughs> So plants have been decreasing, and uh, it doesn't mean that there are more plants in the world. It simply means that there are more plants, plants data available. <coughs> a synthetic way to do this with, is with a polarogram or chronogram, which I described briefly yesterday, and it's a plot in which we put the cyclic component in as a cycle, and we use the radial component for the lineal component of time. So. Uh, in a plot like this, each single point is one single day, from, in this case from the 18th century until now. Okay? That's one single calendar day. And the colors describe the number of available information. And <coughs> this is actually the Spanish data, what we know from Spain. Nothing really in 18th and, and 19th century, more in the 20th century, a big gap here, coincidental with our civil war, and a lot of data in spring and summer, which is when we biologists go to the field because it's we are happily there uh, sampling. And this thing here, what is this? Spoke here. We know what is this. This is January first, okay? More data there. But what is this? Come on, it's easy. It's easy. March. Yeah. 
when day before. The least frequent day sampled in the year. The day that will make you four times younger if you were born that day. February 29th. <laughs> You're born February 29th, you remain young, very young, even at all age. <laughs> okay. This is yesterday's data. I put it in, in, my, in my tool, and this is the Wales data hmm, that we saw yesterday, only from the 20th century, and we saw that the Wales data tend to accumulate in August, September, and it has a second, remember there were a second migration period, but it turns out it was restricted to a very narrow set of three years. So what is this? This is natural, and this is a sampling campaign. So what do we have uh, here? A gap in campaigning here, a gap in ca campaigning afterwards. <coughs> Often it pays to, to mix that up. And uh, I don't remember what is this. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since I went up to for dinner and uh, there was no one, and I hate dinner alone, <laughs> so I went back to my room and, uh, and had some spare time which I should have used to prepare this talk, so it's more articulate, sorry. But I was lazy, so I decided to download the WOLF data and plot the WOLF data there. And uh, this is the WOLF data for Spain. And again, what the heck? Wolves appear only in summer and only recently? We know that wolves tend to appear in winter. They scare people. Uh, yeah, they appear in winter formerly. But nowadays, they only appear in summer. Wolf sighting expeditions in summertime. Another example from a recent work. This is the border between Spain and France. And this is a range of mountains, we, which we call the Pyrenees. It's 3,000 height, 2,000, 3,000 meters high. And there's a lot of data from that region. <coughs> Uh, if you go to GBIF, you can get 400,000 data points ab above the 600 meter line that belong to 13,000 species from more than 75 different localities. So it's a quite compact and interesting data set. But this data set has been compiled over time, over a long time, in fact. So in the 80, in the 19th century, there were more and more and more data available, and more and more data available. In the 19th century, we were 2000, 2000, 2010, and this is basically where we are now. Each dot, the color of the dot, the represents the number of data records there. And you see an enormous amount of different locations. So it's a quite complex and, and complete data set, with a few interesting points here. A few points heavily sampled, and some areas with a high concentration of points, and finally, a region where all the dots are evenly spaced. It's a mountainous region. It's quite difficult to, to, to go to all those places. So why do we have this regular pattern here that has appeared over time? We'll come to it later, all right? Bear with me. Again, this is Spain, and this is the data that were known about preserved specimens. I live here, and this is my region. So since we do have a Museum of Zoology, we have oversampled this region, which is close to the laboratory. Observation, and, oh, sorry, this doesn't run there well, sorry. But before 1960s, there were only a few data here and here. You, don't, you can't see them well. And later on, the stand was much bigger. But there are a number of records, even in my own region, in some other regions, and this big blob here, which are undated records. That's an enormous gap. We know that they are data that sometimes they have appeared in the data set but we have no idea when were they collected. <clears throat> Finally, I go to geographical gaps. 
which have been covered in extenso in, in uh, largely by by town, so I will only add a few a few brush strokes. Geogaps permeate every data set. They appear always in any kind of data set you might collect, ex except for say um, point time data. I mean the data that come from a experimental station that is sampled every year or whatever. Let's throw a few additional concepts to over what we saw in the morning. Like false gaps, boundaries, combined gaps. And uh, the first one <coughs> I want to comment about 